James, how you last so long in public office, 38 years, I say it was easy. Gus Henneberg was my best friend. You need someone who will tell you unfiltered bad news, good news, and also be a problem solver, Ruth. And that's what Gus was all about. How do you describe, when you speak of Gus, how do you describe a man whose life was dedicated to helping others? A voice for the voiceless junior, a fighter for the powerless, and a builder of bridges thought impossible. Gus challenged a powerful labor union. I could also say the mob, we used to call him in the room and I didn't think Gus would come out alive and the union people would come out and be happy. Gus made them believe that hiring minorities was in their best interest, in America's best interest, and everyone would benefit. He was also involved in housing. When you leave today, drive Prince Street because you won't recognize Prince Street. Because I was tearing down all of the public housing. And Gus said, wait a minute, Charles, the court said you got to re replace one for one. Every unit you tear down, you got to put up another one. I said, Gus, Columbus Home was abandoned for 20 years. What are you talking about replace it? He said, Sharp, I'm the court monitor, and you're going to do what the court said. <laughs> and every week and every month, he would go to Judge Davros and tell Sharp didn't do this, Sharp didn't do that. <laughs> Sharp better do it. That was the Gus we know. If this great and humble man was alive today, he would be against this ceremony. Stop it. It's a waste of time. Go out and help someone. Go out and do something. Go out and make a difference in this world. That's the Gus we knew. So how do we remember a great individual, a great civil rights leader, a leader's leader, and a man's man? A loving and dedicated husband and father, we know that, and we've had the benefit of the family. Gus, as you said, Ruth, was an ordinary but an extraordinary man like Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Do we marvel at his positively black program on NBC for over 20 years, educating the community and empowering all of us to share ideas and to communicate. Have we forgotten that love fest? They called them crazy, Ruth. They said it wouldn't work. As you said, riot in the street, blood in the streets. Don't do it, Gus. 100,000 people showed up at Weak Wake Park, and it was a love fest because Gus was a dreamer and made sure it come true. Do you remember because of his intellect, the ability to solve problems, an uh, Army intelligence that he was, as everyone has stated, the first transition chairman for the first African-American mayor of a northeast city, the way you said it, Amiri, I was going to say the same thing, Newark, New Jersey, Ken Gibson, great transition. And yes, Gus did such a great job, fantastic job. Sixteen years later, he was the chairman for the second African-American mayor, Sharp James. He couldn't get rid of Gus. Do we salute his stewardship for developing some of the best affirmative action programs in America? Newark, Liberty International Airport, everyone mentioned. Who remembers going in that duty-free shop? Ed Holder became a millionaire. The shoe shine, the papers, Mr. Burton of Inglewood becoming a millionaire, all because of Gus and all the others. He changed the quality of life and opportunities at the airport. New Jersey University of Medicine and Dentistry, Rutgers University, and yes, Larry, you will speak about the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. It would not have been built. Mary was going to tar and feather me, saying it was going to be a black Taj Mahal, and Symphony Hall would be black Taj Mahal, and Sharp, we are going to tar and feather you, and we shouldn't build it. And then we discovered that it was being built on top of an African-American cemetery. Now the whole community led by Mary Baraka was coming, was coming to City Hall, going to tear down the door and drag me out. The only thing that saved us was Gus Hindenburg stood up before that 
rebel group <laughs> and said, look at the jobs, look at the opportunities, Larry. Over 46% of the workforce building the New Jersey Performing Arts Center look like the citizens of Newark. Gus told them, give it a chance. When I was mayor at that time, I gave a firm action program the largest fuel delivery contract on the planet Earth to a minority, Mr. Britt. I was on the front page of papers in Japan, France, everywhere, and I leaned over to Mr. Britt at the ceremony and said, Mr. Britt, two weeks from now you're going to start delivering fuel to all the municipal buildings. He leaned back and said, but Sharp, there's only one problem. I said, well, what's that? He says, I don't have no trucks. I never expected to win. We never win. <laughs> now, how do I get back this good press? I wake Gus up. Gus, you got to meet me tomorrow. You won't believe this. <laughs> Gus, you won't believe it. What is it? The man don't have no trucks. <laughs> he don't have an office. He don't even have a telephone. He just, he put in a bid thinking he was going to lose. <laughs> Gus says, go out and get every minority who owns a truck and meet me tomorrow. We went to Mrs. Hughes, everyone on Vass Avenue, and Gus stood in front of him and said, guess what? Mr. Britt has a contract, no trucks. You're working for Mr. Britt. We're going to fill every one of these trucks. You're going to deliver the oil, and Mr. Britt will pay you. We will not fail in our affirmative action program. <laughs> on, a, on a personal note, he was a tennis player as Bob Kirvin started off. And I was playing tennis with Dave Dinkins, who loved tennis more than he loved being mayor of New York City. And we went to the islands every week, and he had a celebrity tournament. He said, Sharp, come and play in the celebrity tournament. I took Althea Gibson, and we won. The next time he invited me, you have to pick partners, you know. <laughs> he invited me again, and I took off Ash, and we won. The third time he invited me, I said, Gus, no Althea Gibson, no uh, 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 Althea and Arthur. I took Gus. Gus said, I got bad knees, right? I got bad so Don't worry about it. You're going to play the net. I'm going to run the baseline. When I say one, you go to the left. When I say two, you go to the right. When I say three, you duck. <laughs> I call out three. Gus duck. I hit the ball about 100 miles an hour. You know what happened. Dave Dinkins coming to the net, gets hits in the eye, knocks him out. He's blind for about six months, wearing a patch. And then we did all the apologies and all of that. We won the tournament, of course. <laughs> so whenever I went into Gus's office, he would get the headlines of the New York paper and say, Sharp, have you noticed something? I said, what? He said, they never invited us back. <laughs> Finally. An avid boater, never forget the Rainbow Yacht Club, that Gus was one of the prime, pioneer members of it. Every Friday, I see the workers here, he would call the staff. We're going out on the Long Island Sound. He invited Sharp James, came back the same day that he brought us back to Menopor on his boat, and I saw a boat up there and I bought it. Gus said, well, you're crazy? You bought the boat the first day? For the next 15 years, we were boaters up and down a Long Island Sound. And then, of course, it was always an occasion where Gus told me when I went to see him at the nursing home. Everybody said we were communicating. He said, Sharp, there's only one thing I forgot to tell you. There's only two moments of happiness for a boater. I said, what's that, Gus? He said, when you buy and when you sell. His <laughs> boat was up for sale. My boat is up for sale. We still can't sell. <laughs> In closing, before you give me the hook, Clement. <laughs> Langston Hughes had to be thinking of this occasion. When he wrote, I sought to hear the voice of God and climb the top most steeple. But God declared, go down again, for I dwell among the people. Today, tonight, we are here to say thank God for having allowed this angel sent from heaven to dwell among the people. He was our friend.
He was our leader. He was worthy. I've learned that a group of citizens have submitted a petition to Almighty God for Elvis to come back. Others have submitted a petition for Ted Williams to come back. Others have submitted a petition for Houdini to come back. When I look at the problem facing us today, the conditions of our city and town, and the question of Mary that you raised, whether well, Symphony Hall is going to be black and New Jersey Pack is going to be white, one person could stand and put that merger together, Larry. One person who would say they should be one entity, not a black facility, not a white one, and that would be Gus Sinnenberg. I offer a petition, please, almighty God, you're going to bring Elvis, Ted Williams, and Houdini back, bring Gus Hindenburg back first.